to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. Now, Reed, in today's episode, we're going to introduce the audience to Captain Megan Thiem, good friend of mine. You'll hear in the interview that we went to Squadron Officer School together, and I was way super impressed by her at the time. She's a really easygoing, fun-to-talk-to person, but man, there is a whole lot of substance here that I am so excited to share with our audience. I mean, you're going to hear it, but for example, she was a combat medic in the Army. How cool is that? Yeah, and she seems like someone who's always got something going on. Yeah. There's a lot that we can learn about, and I know we'll talk about it later on in the episode, but yeah, really excited for this interview. I certainly learned a lot. I'm going to eat some humble pie here. Can't (laughs) wait to bring what she offers our audience. I'm looking forward to sharing it today. Yeah, today's episode is going to be about Megan's experience in the Air Force and her career field of being a nurse, and most specifically about being a flight nurse. So let's cut there over to Captain Megan Theme. Welcome, Captain Megan Theme, to the show. It's such an awesome experience, such a wonderful pleasure to have you here for a couple of different reasons. First of all, you know, you and I went to SOS together, Squadron Officer School, had a great time, got to know each other there with the rest of the flight, you know, really great friendships that came out of that to include this one. But also, you are the first person to come on the show to talk about the medical side of being an officer in the Air Force. And so this is a really special opportunity for me personally to get to talk with you again, but also to help me better understand what's going on on the medical side of the Air Force, but also for the audience who have not yet had a chance to hear from an officer who is working medical for the Air Force. So Welcome to the show. So excited to have you. Thank you. Let's turn it over to you for a few minutes to introduce yourself, tell us who you are, where you're from, how you got into the Air Force, and how you decided to go into the nursing career field. So my name is Megan Thiem, and I am from San Diego, California. Ooh. I have an You can do worse than that. You can do much worse than that. And it kind of sets you up for failure in life because then you expect everywhere to be great. But so I actually have kind of a weird story. I joined the Army, enlisted as a combat medic when I was 19 years old. Wow. Yeah, for a few reasons. Not everyone knows this story, but a few reasons. I had been working two jobs and going to school full time and was kind of at this part where I was exhausted from living like that, still barely making rent in San Diego with three roommates and really just like wanted a change. I had applied for nursing school and was waitlisted and just really wanted to do something different. I had always wanted to serve my country. And I had also like chickened out at 17 of joining the National Guard just because I like <laughs> talked myself out of it. So that was still in my head. I knew I wanted to serve though. And man, that college money looked really good as well. So right. I went to the recruiter and said I I wanted to be infantry, and they laughed at me because that was in 2004 when girls couldn't do that. Mm. And so I said, okay, well, I'm in between criminal justice and medicine, so how about military police? And they said, well, we have a spot for you in six months. I did not want to wait that long, so I said, what about combat medic? And they said, you can leave in four weeks. So I took it. There you go. I signed that day. It was the same week as my 19th birthday and left for the Army. So. After five and a half-ish years as an Army combat medic, I got out because I really wanted to go to school. We were in this rapid deployment cycle where we deployed every other year. There was really no opportunity for education other than the community college classes I was doing here and there, even deployed from Iraq. And I got out. So I went to nursing school at University of Colorado using my GI Bill. Okay. Yeah, in Denver, I went to nursing school. 
I was working at Children's Hospital Colorado while I was there, loving working with kids, loving the gig, applied for some of the top pediatric nurse practitioner programs while I was there, got into the number one in the nation, University of Pennsylvania, and took it, because why not? <laughs> yeah. While I was going there, I knew I wanted to come back in the military. The Army doesn't have pediatric nurse practitioners, just the Air Force and Navy, and the Air Force office. Like they were open, there was someone there to talk to me, <laughs> started working with me right away. So Air Force it was. And it's very serendipitous that I am where I am today. Right. I assumed they would want me because, you know, I had this Ivy League education and I was prior service. So when I was rejected two years in a row, it hurt a little, but they only took one a year. My third year, I finally got accepted. And then got to be a pediatric nurse practitioner a few years and then actually going to SOS with while well, you were there, Colin, yep. I got to kind of like find my spark of missing that operational piece that really I feel like I'm part of the military piece. Sure. Yeah. I realized I wanted to be a flight nurse, did the entire application period, which was very long and arduous, but got it and then just trained to do that over the summer. And then now I'm living my dream being a flight nurse. No, oh, that's awesome. So let me just wrap my head around this. <laughs> At age 19, you went into the army mm -hmm. to do the combat medic thing. Like people being shot at, you run up to them and you patch up their wounds. Yes. Okay. So you did that thing in Iraq. Yes. Okay. And then you go from there to joining the Air Force, kind of like a green to blue sort of program. Well, not green to blue program, but that's what you did. You went from green to blue. Yeah and got rejected a couple of times in there, but eventually ended up in the Air Force. You said they only take one a year. So basically like they chose you to be the pediatric nurse practitioner for the Air Force. <laughs> and you go from patching up broken and wounded bodies in Iraq to helping children in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. Okay, help me understand all that. <laughs> what, how, how does somebody do that? So logistically or just big picture? <laughs> big picture. How do you make that mind shift, but also some of the nuts and bolts of making that transition? Yeah. So big picture and mind shift, it's, I think at the core is just service and wanting to help people. And I've okay. always had that. And I think a lot of people have that, whether it was, you know, helping people in the army, like you said, like patching them up after they were shot or blown up or et cetera, and transporting them, which I'll get back to in just a second. But, okay. And then going to a hospital and helping everyone from, you know, grandpa to a newborn baby is actually a really similar concept. You're just still trying to help people and trying to make the most terrible time in their life the best experience it can be. Like you want to give them stellar medical care, but also yeah. a huge part of that is, I don't want to say customer service because that makes it sound really cheesy and like you're calling a call center, but it is that other aspect of humanizing their experience and, you know, offering a pillow and just trying to like make them understand that you're trying to help them as much as possible and actually doing that. So it's been kind of cool to go through that Kids are just extra fun to work with because they just, I mean, you know, you're around them. They're a good time. Oh, I thought you were going to say that I am one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we both are to a certain extent, but they're fun. They say crazy stuff and they're bounceable, right? They fall, they get back up. Like they yeah. do, they're fun to work with. And what's really cool now is now my job is that second piece from when the person gets hurt on the battlefield. Now I get to help transport them. So okay. my flight nurse job is transporting people to get the medical care that they need or to get back to their families and like continue that healing piece. So it's been really cool to kind of do it first full circle, if you will. Yeah, for sure. We'll definitely want to get into the flight nurse aspect of it since that's what you're doing now. But let's talk a little bit more about the logistics yes. of going from Army enlisted combat medic to being a Air Force nurse practitioner. What were some of the hoops you had to jump through? You were rejected a couple of times somewhere in there, but you know, what were some of those more salient points, things that people need to be aware of if they want to follow a similar path? Yeah, absolutely. So I'd say the big thing is always working towards your goal. So I try to mentor a lot of the enlisted folks around me or even the nurses who are just looking for that next step of yeah. you can kind of always be working on where you want to go next. So when I was enlisted, I was enlisted total like a little over five years. And other than when I was in like heavy duty 
you know, basic training and medic training, which was like six months all together. Other than right. that time frame, I was almost always was in school. And even if it was just one class, like I was going to school either online and in person to keep going. I knew yeah. eventually I wanted a degree in whatever. I kind of was headed toward nursing, didn't really know, but I knew no matter what I wanted my education. So kind of just working those little points. And then, you know, it ended up where I've probably taken 20 plus classes that I never even needed just because I was like just working, working, working. But it's really hard to start school if you're not doing it. It's really easy to keep going. Yeah. So I'm always just telling people, just sign up for one class, like, and then just keep going. And once you're in one, you realize all you're really missing out on is like an hour or two of Netflix a week. Like anyone can sacrifice that in their life. Right. And it's just kind of working on that next step. So for me, it was constantly doing one class at a time. There was a point in my second deployment to Iraq where I was taking anatomy and physiology two online, and they sent me a microscope and a fetal pig in the mail. And I was literally <laughs> doing classes by myself at the and also teaching the medics under me as their sergeant, like, look what you can learn too from what I'm learning. So yeah. constantly learning. And then, I mean, that's the biggest piece, I think, is just kind of knowing where you want to go with that and seeing what other people are doing. And if you're interested in that, I had told you, like, I didn't even know this flight nurse job existed until a couple of years ago. And then right. through networking and through meeting different people, that's how you find out, hey, this awesome thing exists that I never would have known about otherwise. So I think that's the biggest thing is constantly work on that next goal. And education is a big one, especially if you're starting with none or little. And then a lot of that networking, just so you can see what else is out there and what you might want to do. Yeah, for sure. And so while you're working on that continuing education piece, or even once you have completed your degree, you're going to have to work with a recruiter, right? Yes. I mean, you had left the army. Yes. So you were out, you were civilian, and so you needed to develop a relationship yes. and a connection with a recruiter in order to come into the Air Force. Talk to us a little bit about how that worked. Yeah, that can really be one of the hardest parts. And I think actually is probably a barrier to a lot of great people joining. It really depends like the quality of recruiter service you're getting on where you are and who that person is. Like I literally didn't join the Navy because I couldn't get this guy to call me back. Like that's insane. Okay. But that's a thing. And you'll hear that from a lot of different people. So you do have to be persistent. Sometimes they're dying to get you. Other times, like especially medical, they're not dying to get you. They do one right. nursing board, which is just they're looking at a bunch of paperwork. They do one a year. So you spend months and months and months trying to like work on this packet and like printing high school transcripts that you haven't seen in 16 years, <laughs> right. like crazy stuff. And then you still wait. And then once the board meets, you wait a month or two to find out if you made it or not. And yeah, being rejected sucks. I was shocked, but it's a fact of life. And I'm really glad I kept trying. Yeah, For me, it was great because I got to you know, get experience on the outside. A lot of my medical coworkers have only worked medicine in the military. Uh -huh. So it's kind of cool to have that other perspective. I did two years private practice and then a year GS. So I know what it is like to see like a crazy amount of patients a day to have patients without insurance. So it gives you a different perspective, but you have to really be persistent on working with a recruiter and know that it's going to take a lot of time. If anyone thinks they're going to become an officer in the next like month or two, like throw that expectation away. Right. <laughs> My experience was I started spring of 2013, I finally found out I got in 2015. November, December, and didn't leave for commission officers training until May 2016. So even once I got the hey, you're in, it was still another six or seven months. So yeah, you should have those expectations if it's going to be a while. <laughs> Reed and I have talked about that at length in this show that Becoming an officer through any of the commissioning sources is not a short or very streamlined and easy no. process, <laughs> which is one of the major motivations for doing this show to begin with is to try and peel that curtain back and yeah. help people manage their expectations. Yeah. But also at the same time, paint the picture of how amazing that this life can be being a member of the profession of arms. And if this is something that you really want to go do, there is a path. It's just going to be a rather unclear, rather bumpy <laughs> yeah. one 
to actually make it happen. It's true. I joke that it's a battle of the wills. So you have to like mm. really, really mm -hmm. want it. Keep trying for it. Your average nurse will get in their first year as long as you, you know, not something terrible in your life. If you're just going for like regular nursing, you're probably going to get in your first try. But it is harder if you're going for a specialty. But yeah, agreed. If you just kind of know that expectation of this is going to take a while and it may take more than one try, I 100% think it's worth it and would do it again in a heartbeat and did try multiple times. So. Cool. And so you did finally get accepted. And then you went to COT, Commission Officer Training. Yes. Which is different from the regular OTS. Yes. Or at least it was at the time. It was. Things are different now. Yes. But can you kind of talk through like what your experience was? And also, most specifically, that again, going back to that mindset, shifting away from here, your background is Army <laughs> Combat Medic. <laughs> Moving into Air Force Medical Service. Yes. So I didn't really know what to expect. At the time, you're completely right. So now it's the same, regardless of your career. But at the time, commission officers training, as you know, was just for medical, for JAG, and for chaplains. And we come in commission. So we all come in wearing our rank. We've already commissioned before getting there. And you would go for, I believe it was either five or six weeks compared to the eight weeks. Yep. And then, of course, the other difference is those people in the like traditional officers training, you know, don't already have their rank and their commission. They're working for that. So you come in with that already. It was interesting. I didn't know what to expect. What I heard was, quote unquote, it's going to suck, but it'll be OK. And that's a really good description because it's not yeah. pleasant. The big differences between commission officers training the Air Force and the Army is it's much more of a mind game in the Air Force. Like, mm -hmm. we're going to give you 30 reading assignments that we know you don't have time for. We're going to super stress you out. But also your lights have to be out at 1130 p.m. or you're in trouble and you have to be up to do PT at 430 a.m. or you're in trouble. So you're just exhausted the whole time and you have way more work than you could ever do in the time frame given. For me, I don't think it was as overwhelming just because I have done the lack of sleep thing at great length. I have done the very overwhelmed physically and mentally. But where the Army basic training was very challenging physically, you're constantly doing physical punishment and physical training in general. There was much less of that. I think we did PT maybe 10 times in five weeks. Like it was <laughs> yeah. very little physical conditioning or challenge. It was much more mental. It was very funny though. People come in with some crazy expectations. I remember lots of people saying, I can't believe we have to march. <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, it's the military. Cool. And a lot of people really didn't take well to like an adult screaming in their face. Not that there's much of that there, but in the very beginning, they try to do a little bit of that shell shock. You know, they want you to- sure get in that military mindset. So for me, I'm, you know, like I've been screamed at like a thousands of times, like it didn't really bother me. It was like, <laughs> well, this is annoying now that I'm older and I've done this before, but it was fine. There were people who did not do well with that. There were also people that were told they didn't really need to be ready to take a PT test, but they do one in the very beginning. Yeah. We had one of those massive groups of people. I think we had like 300 something people in our class and over 20 went home the first day because they couldn't get close to passing for a PT test, which is- wow mind-blowing to me because I'm like of course you're gonna do a PT test for the rest of your life in the Air Force right. so, <laughs> so yeah really a lot more just mentally challenging and emotionally challenging okay so you had been prepared a little bit for that kind of thing because of your army background mm -hmm. but what would you say to someone who doesn't have that yeah and obviously some people really struggled not having that background or not having the right set of expectations going into commission officer training at the time now it's just total force officer training there at the officer training school. What would you recommend for those people so they can be in the right mindset, especially if they don't have that military background already? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a few things you can really do. I think the biggest one is like we just talked about, be able to smoke your PT test. Like the minimum standards are not difficult for kind of your average person to be able to meet. And if they are, work on those, you know, like you should be able to go in there, at least meet the minimums on day one. Like don't be sent home because of that. Or like we had three people out of 11 who struggled with it the entire time, like never fully passed those sections. So work on that. The other thing is what they used to do is they 
they used to actually have a PDF book that was like 40 mini pages. Yeah. They made us carry around during COT. It still exists. Yes. So they let you see it's that. called the Be OTS manual. Yes. The Otsman. Yep. You can get it before you go there. Had I known, mm -hmm. we would be literally taking tests on that manual and following every little silly, sometimes silly thing in there. I would have read it before. I knew I was coming. You for can call them silly. It's silly. It's silly. So I knew I was going there for six months, but not one person said like, hey, you should actually like open that sucker up because it's kind of like a side note on the website of where to go. It's like there's this mm -hmm. thing here, but it doesn't tell you how important it is. That's your like your Bible, if you will, while you're there, like you have to know it forward and backward. And the other thing is just really know what works for you for coping skills. So if you know you get super stressed, but it helps to make a list. Bring some stuff so you can make lists. I knew I like wanted my morning coffee. I brought a hot water boiler and instant coffee. Yeah. If you know it's just talking to your family, know that they gave you way more stuff that can ever fit into your time bucket. So set aside that 15 minutes or whatever it is every night so you can talk to your family. You know, like do those things that you're going to probably already been doing for the last nine months with this crazy COVID stuff. Use those coping skills that you've developed. Use it there. And then just remember, it's a short time. You can do anything cruddy for a short time. <laughs> it's perspective, <laughs> right? Like, no, it's, it's only eight weeks. Like, it's going to suck for eight weeks, but then it's over. And the real military is not like that. That was the other thing. I had like very sweet, fresh faced friends who were like, do we have to march everywhere in the real military? And I'm like, no, <laughs> you'll never march again. It's fine. So like, keep that perspective too. They're not going to like little, you know, like E6s are not going to scream at you every day at your real life job. Like, it's okay. It's just here. <laughs> They don't know that. I had a dental right. friend who he would, he hadn't even gone to dental school yet. He was like a brand new and now he's a resident here at Travis and we laugh about it because I was like, oh, you didn't know anything. Like you were so scared. <laughs> Yeah. So just listening to you rattle off these different recommendations, really what it comes down to in my mind, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is you need to prepare yourself ahead of time, physically and mentally, and recognize that the game of Air Force training begins before you ever show up. It actually begins, you know, while you're still in school working on your degree and continues as you're working with the recruiter. Yeah. Can you stick with yes. it? Right? <laughs> yes. Can you handle some rejection that's going to you know, delay your entrance into the military for a year or two or three or in some instances like five years? Yep. Are you going to stick with it? Yep. And you need to prepare yourself for all of that. Absolutely. So MEPS is one of those things like you have to get through that. There was a very sweet, she was trying to be Air Force Reserve nurse who I went through MEPS with and some E6 yelled at her there and she like broke down and was like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Again, that's part of the prep. Like, can I take someone not being super nice to me <laughs> and get through this process? It's true. Yeah. Well, very good. So Clearly, you were prepared for it. You succeeded. You got through commission officer training and you got into the Air Force. You're now a commissioned officer. You are part of the nursing corps. So let's move our discussion there to describe what is the nursing corps? Yes. What is that career field? Just kind of, you know, broad strokes of what Air Force nursing is mm -hmm. and help the audience just understand a little bit more about how that functions within the Air Force. Yeah, absolutely. So Nurse Corps is one of the very large corps we have. It operates like completely independently from Medical Corps, which a lot of people get kind of confused with. We're completely different from them. And Dental Corps. I just learned something right now. <laughs> I had no idea that they were different. Yeah. So there's like the line number people, and then there's Dental Corps, Medical Corps, Nursing Corps. We're like completely different. So I had no idea. It's interesting. Thank you. So you're welcome. Where most of us are in the nursing corps is in your friendly outpatient clinic or inpatient hospital. You have nurses working just like a nurse would in any other civilian practice, if you will. So okay. doing procedures, calling patients, doing telephone consults, which is like the bane of every outpatient nurse's existence, but it's a thing. And then same thing in the hospital. They're you know, helping birth babies, they're putting IVs in, they're working the emergency room. You can pretty much do anything you can on the outside, on the inside as a nurse. And then there's also specialties. So we have nurse practitioners of every breed, if you will. We have clinical nurse specialists. We have CRNAs, certified registered nurse anesthesiologists. Okay. 
anything you can do on the outside, you can do on the inside nursing, which is really cool. And each of those has kind of their own AFSC that goes along they with do. it. And, yeah. And career so, development path and all that. So the career development paths are pretty wide for all of nursing. So everyone's going to have their own AFSC. And then we have these big career development areas. One is becoming an expert in your area. So you could say, I just want to be a clinical nurse specialist. I want to be a nurse practitioner. And I just want to be like really good in the expert at doing this job. Okay. There's all also the area of I want to work in kind of as you go on in your career of informatics of doing statistics type stuff and working public health and working with technology and then okay. just like big air force we have a command track so you can be a flight commander and then you can oh, be okay. a squadron commander i've had group commanders who are nurses there's a surgeon general you know like a chief nurse of the air force you know, like these are all you can do the same big jobs that anyone else can in any position at the leadership levels wow yeah, again, learning new things for me. <laughs> See, this is why we have to have these conversations. <laughs> I had it in my mind that nurses just fell into the bigger medical core of the Air Force and that they shared positions with the medical doctors. Like sometimes the medical doctor will be the commander, sometimes the nurse. Well, I didn't realize that they're going to be separate. And that's right to a certain extent. So in a medical group where the whole squadron consists of, you know, medical technicians and doctors and nurses and medical service corps, who has that position is going to depend on who got that position. So you can have okay. an MSC who's the commander, but in the nurse corps itself, you also have nurses staffing all those nurse core positions so okay so i wasn't completely off we're not right. completely off at all but just yes nurses can staff those positions and then we staff our own as well okay and then they're still commanders they still get like g-series orders and you know have responsibility for ucmj responsibility and yes. non-judicial punishment and that kind of thing even though you are non-line officers yes Absolutely. And same thing, doctors and medical service corps will fill those positions too. And same thing. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay. Yeah, it is interesting. And actually a lot of nurses will hold those positions. My first assignment, my flight commander, squadron commander, and group commander were all nurses and all female nurses. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, that's so cool. Basically, the nursing corps does all things nursing, mm -hmm. just as you would see on the outside of the Air Force. They do that for the Air Force. Mm -hmm. But help me understand just why have officers be nurses? I mean, I can picture in my mind why we need the medical practice. Obviously, yeah. you know, we're fleshy meat bags. We need to, you know, <laughs> still be kept healthy, even though we're superheroes that wear zipper suits and camouflage armor. We can still get hurt. Right. We can still get sick. We still need help in that regard, right? Mm -hmm. Why do nurses need to be officers? Help me understand that a little bit. So my thought is the many ways nurses have helped in the military and fulfilled their role, that they are going to be the officer on the scene to not only have the clinical authority and competence, but also they need that military authority kind of backing them up to say, like, I'm the one in the room making the decision. This is what's happening with this patient. We do give direct orders to our technicians. We do give direct orders to our patients even. Oh, and interesting. There are family members, potentially, especially in the Aravac world where that's my plane. So you need to do what I say to stay safe and to keep everyone safe. So I think some of it is that. And I think it's just having the clinical knowledge. Of course, you have that at least bachelor's degree level of nursing knowledge and have been certified as a registered nurse to be an officer in the nurse corps. Okay. Yeah. So there's some legal requirements mm -hmm. you know, in order to meet yeah, outside the military, just in general, this is what our society and our government has set up as you must meet these standards and these requirements in order to to legally practice nursing. Mm -hmm. So there's that piece of it. There's the military piece of it, right? That's how the military functions is that, you know, there's a hierarchy of, you know, officer and enlisted and officer provides the vision and context for the mission and some circumstances, like you mentioned, some direct orders on how to carry it out. And I mean, that all makes sense in my mind, but I have to ask, is it possible to do the Air Force nursing mission without an officer? Could that be done? Could we outsource that to off-base nursing and medical practitioners? Is that in the realm of possibility or am I, I completely off-base there? 
No, there's actually a lot being said and thrown around in the defense health agency's policies in the last couple of years at pushing out a lot of that specialty care. The big thing for why we need Air Force nurses and Air Force medical personnel in general, though, is when we go to war, we can't bring Joe, Tom, and Bob. So even if you said, you're right, in the States, we don't need this, we could outsource all this, because readiness is like the ultimate Air Force mission, you have to be ready to deploy and fill that job. Right. That's why we have Air Force nurses, because we need us for when we deploy. And my career field especially, we're constantly deploying. We typically deploy like once every 18 months or so. We have to have those people ready to do the mission. It's always yeah. readiness first. Yeah. Okay. So putting the stateside mission aside, you have a contingency, you know, a field competency that you have to, to carry out. So let's shift that direction. First talk more broadly, does an Air Force nurse do downrange that, for lack of a better term, justifies that they be a military officer in order to carry that out? And then we'll get into more of the specifics around your career field now that you've trained into of being a flight nurse. So big picture nursing first in a downrange deployed environment, and then we'll move to the flight nurse. Okay. The easiest way I would relate just to start talking about like a downrange mission or just contingency missions in general is the COVID response in this last year. We have people actively deployed all over the United States and the world supporting the COVID mission right now. That's that piece right there. The other contingency things we do and regularly do is every single hurricane, wildfire, major earthquake. For all those, we do the same contingency missions too, just because I think a lot of people just think deployment, but right. we do that all. And I mean, I know so many people have deployed in that just in the last year or actively deployed right now in that COVID mission. But when you're talking about in a war situation, like a true combat deployment, what you're talking about is, is nurses not only giving direct medical care, smaller bases, bigger bases, like working in the surgery centers, helping transport those patients, working at little tiny clinics when people have a cold, giving them cold medicine, all the way to <laughs> what I do now, transporting those people from Kuwait to... Germany to the States. We really do all those different pieces. And then also, I think I kind of overlooked it, but one of the big pieces of why we have nurses as officers is we do a lot of those command positions. Like I said, my first yeah. station was my entire chain of command was nurses. They have a problem just like pilots getting out, doctors get out. They can make a lot more money on the outside. Right. Whereas nurses, like we make, like just to be flat out, you know, transparent, we make a good amount of money in the military. Most nurses make more in the military than you would on the outside. That's interesting. It's a good life for lots of reasons. So a lot more of us stay in and we need officers to fill these ranks, flight commander, squadron commander, group commander, et cetera. So yeah, very cool. Yeah. Going back to the command, really, that's the purpose of an officer period, right? that latent within each of us is that potential for command. Right. Whether we actually are in a command position or not, we still have the responsibility of being prepared for the time when the command does follow to us. Absolutely. Whether hired into a squadron commander position or, God forbid, World War III breaks out and you know, the command structure is eliminated and you're that guy or girl right. that must be prepared to accept the responsibility when the opportunity comes. Absolutely. Okay. So we've hinted at it. Let's talk about it now. The flight nurse position. Yeah. You've very recently retrained into that. You said that that bug was put in your ear while we were at SOS. Talk to us how you went from being a pediatric nurse practitioner to becoming now a flight nurse. Absolutely. So the bug got put in my ear while we were at SOS in a couple different ways. One of them was we had a couple pilots in our flight. Just a couple. I mean, Just we a had couple. like. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few, a few. I've forgotten count. <laughs> We had like six. Yeah, it was a lot. I mean, I was that like nerdy kid who like watched Top Gun too many times and wanted to be a pilot when I was like a kid. So just that kind of like re-sparked my interest in, I don't know, flight and doing cool stuff. I've been yeah. living in Minot, North Dakota as my first duty station and just like. Oofta. 
Yeah, oofta for real. Just watching the time go by and uh, I don't know, was bored. So I got that spark from like listening to these people who are really passionate about what they do and they were exciting, fun things. They were deployments, which I wasn't going to do in my PNP job. It was flying, which I certainly wasn't going to do in my PNP job. TDYs, like all these opportunities for travel. And I had already been kind of just bored in primary care. Primary care is very like soul sucking at times and it's very <laughs> monotonous. It's the same thing every day. Like you'll see six diaper rashes in one day, not to like tell anyone not to do that. It's great. I loved it. I'll go back to it at some point maybe, but I was ready for a change. And because of my army time where I did do cool stuff and I did combat deployments, like I really missed that operational piece. So I randomly talked to a flight nurse at SOS at one of our social things. And I went, Oh my God, that's a job. I didn't even realize that. Yeah. Isn't that interesting that even when you're in the career field, you still don't know that there are things yep. available to you in the career field. Had no idea. Much less like I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that you didn't know is, and that's true across all of our career fields. Absolutely. That there are things that we just don't know are available to us because yep. nobody's telling us. Yep. And even in our individual jobs, like I've like in six months, I've learned so much more about like, wait, that job exists there. Yeah. So yeah, if you are not stationed somewhere where AE air evacuation is, which is only for active duty stations, you won't know anything about it. Right. They're not a part of the med group. If you don't have that mission where you are, you don't know about it. And you're right. That's the same about lots of jobs. So I had that spark in my mind. I already knew I was going to Kadena Air Force Base in Okinawa, which was exciting and amazing. And I loved every second of it. But when I got there, I talked to my chief nurse right away. Every medical group has a chief nurse and our AE squadrons have a chief nurse. And I talked to my chief nurse and I said, hey, I'm interested in this. And I really, I asked one question. I said, is this a career killer? On the outside, if you go from a nurse practitioner to a nurse, you can. I mean, people need nurses. Like, no one's going to be like, oh, we're not going to hire you because of that. But it doesn't look great on paper. Like, you're kind of, like, going down in your responsibilities. You're definitely going down in your authority. And you're making a lot less money, which is the opposite in the Air Force, funny enough. but <laughs> Because of flight pay and all that. Flight pay and the bonus. The bonus is way bigger for flight nurses than nurse practitioners, which is wow. mind blowing, but not mad about it. So I asked her, <laughs> is this a career killer? And I said, and just honestly, what do you think? And she said, Megan, I was a flight nurse and it was the best job I've ever had in my entire life. And she said, not only that, but this is a career builder for you. Awesome. This is working in operations. This is working at an operational level for the Air Force. If you want to do it even a little bit, she's like, go for it. That's all I needed to hear to like fly full in there. And Colonel Julie Skinner was just amazing. So helpful. Such a great chief nurse. So that was right when I got to Kadena. I still had two more years there. So, yeah. but I started that process right away and the whole time she knew that's what I wanted I was very honest with her about what I wanted and she was very helpful with that so that's definitely my advice to anyone is whoever your mentor is there especially for nurses it's your chief nurse talk to them early right away get on their radar volunteer for stuff for me like I knew her kids so I was always like ah you know, like <laughs> I want her to know who I am and what's going on. And she was extremely helpful and I'm sure she would have been helpful regardless, but I think going out of my way to make sure she knew what I wanted helped, but it's a big process. You do a flight physical, which sounds like a 20 minute thing and you're done, but it's really weeks of stuff and EKG, special eye yeah. tests, hearing tests. It's so much stuff. And then for me, I had like something really silly and small that held me up for six months to get it signed off. And then once that happened, I'd already submitted a bunch of paperwork, of course, and that my chief nurse supported me. Right. It was a phone interview. We were chatting. And at the end, she asked me if I had any questions. And I was like, oh, well, just the one, ma'am. Like, when will I find out if I'm chosen or not to, you know, be this glorious flight nurse position that I want? And she, she simply said, oh, we're a low man career field. If you want the job, it's yours. And I was like, <laughs> So I was very excited. I'm like, I'm going to be a flight nurse. And that was summer of 2019. And then like shortly they realized, oh yeah, you have to finish out your commitment at Kadena before you can do that. So <laughs> okay. they said, go ahead and like literally the next couple of days, they said, go ahead and start booking your class dates. They booked me for like survival training that ended up getting canceled because of COVID. And then my classes for flight nurse training and, you know, COVID made things a little crazy this past year, but no matter what, I knew I was going to be moving. I got assigned to Travis Air Force Base. That's where I am now in Northern California. And I knew I was going to be doing these trainings. 
So there's two back-to-back one-month courses you do at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The first one is all about flight nursing itself, about being a flight nurse. Mm -hmm. There's a huge emphasis on specific medical conditions and then how flying, the physiology of flying, especially the way we do it, which is a little harsher than commercial flying, how these things affect conditions that people already have and how can they affect a random person who maybe hasn't flown at that altitude before. So it's mostly medical the first month and then the second you do like a lot of codes and a lot of practice procedures it's fun it's a good refresher for like things you hadn't thought about in like eight years from nursing school right and then the next month you start the next day is all about the aircraft Mm. it's a little more hardcore i was not anticipating this at all i had (laughs) no idea what to expect i had no idea that i would become the expert on a couple aircrafts and their electrical oxygen systems their egresses their emergency procedures. It's kind of crazy. That's the big difference between like us as flight nurses and like some random nurse who's just on a plane or even a uh, sea cat who's like kind of like flying ICU. They do a course about medicine. They do nothing about the aircraft. So we really become experts on our aircraft, which is kind of cool. Yeah, because you're now part of the crew, right? Exactly. You are. And even once you get to your unit, so you do the training and then I did have to go back and do some survival training. But once you've done that, your unit and Aravac squadron is not part of the med group. It is not part of the hospital. I don't even know anyone who works over there. We are part of the ops group. So you're part of operations, which is pretty cool when you've been stuck in a med group for a while. (laughs) (laughs) Why do you say that? I mean, obviously there are some differences. What are those differences going from medical now to operations? Yeah, it's definitely like a more relaxed atmosphere. We don't have these crazy, you know, you need to see 18 patients a day kind of things put on us. Yes, we don't, we don't really have quotas. So we, there's all these different parts of AE and, you know, part of their job is to get as many flights as we can. And we all want to fly as much as we can, but then you have these other jobs you do too, but most of them are pretty, you know, like, A lot more laid back than the med group environment, for sure. And just a cooler mission. It's a nice change, I should say. It's fantastic taking care of service members and their families every single day. But it's also really fantastic, like, doing your job and then getting to fly. Like, I flew last week in a KC-135. I'll fly this week in a C-130. It's just cool to be able to do that. Last month, we did a Hawaii to Japan, back to Hawaii, and then San Diego. And it's just, like, very cool to be able to do that. And we work really closely with the pilots and the crew chief and the load masters or boom operator, depending on what plane you're on. It's just fun. It's cool. Yeah. And so you've only been doing this for a few months now Mm -hmm. since you've completed training. So you haven't yet, like you haven't deployed yet. No. But have you still been able to do some operational type of things? Yeah, I have. When you actually get to your unit, they have you do, even though you just did nothing but qualifying forever, they have you do a whole other qualification training so that you can be mission ready with that unit. And so you get to fly a lot during that. So that one to Japan and back was a live mission. So I think we had eight patients all together. You kind of take different people to different places. We had eight patients all together and it was amazing. Such a great experience to be able to do that live medical care. Met some like amazing people with the mission, but then the patients too. Like they're stories and meeting their families and or just them was like really amazing and really brought home like this is why I wanted to do this job. Yeah. Yes, it's operational and cooler and I get to wear a flight suit and I don't have to be at the med group anymore. But it also <laughs> is being able to help these people in a way that feels more meaningful at the time, you know, just because what I've been doing for it was a good change for me. So it's been really fun to do that. And then I'm going on a joint mission I just found out today in a couple of weeks where it's like a big joint exercise for two weeks where we're working with the army and different forces. Like, so that'll be cool. That's more training, yeah. obviously, not like live missions, but that'll be fun. But yeah, it's been cool so far. I've been really enjoying it. That's so cool. Really, like just looking at your whole career. So cool. This young girl coming into a recruiter station wanting to join the army and you end up as a combat medic. (laughs) And there are some deployment experiences, probably some pretty harrowing stuff that is not your favorite thing to remember, but you were there in the fight. You saw what we were doing there downrange. And then you took those experiences into the Air Force, into the nursing corps, but you still had like that operational stink on you. (laughs) And you're like, I need to get back to that. Yes. 
And here you are doing the ops thing again, continuing to save lives and help people all around the world. It's just this arc of your story is just so fascinating to listen to. And it speaks volumes to you as a person to make that kind of thing happen. You didn't let it happen to you, but you made this path you shaped it, you committed to it, you willed it to happen, even though clearly there were some setbacks in there. And it hasn't all been you know, sunshine and roses, obviously. But it's just so fascinating to listen to. And I mean, I'm inspired about it. I've been instructed. It's been really, really amazing. If you could give like one major highlight from that whole arc, something that you will take with you, and you can say, because that thing happened, my time in the Air Force was worth it. What would that be? What comes to mind? I mean, maybe not a popular answer, but really for me, it's the relationships I've made. My best friend is a girl I went to basic training with in 2004, and we went to Europe together last summer and the summer before that, and we hung out in Ohio this summer. And I have so many stories like that of people who you make these bonds with in the military and sucky situations yeah. that become your family. And you, I don't know, that's been my favorite thing about the military, hands down. Like, yes, I've had amazing educational opportunities. Yes, I've been able to help a lot of people, which I feel good about. I have tremendous pride in like the service I've been able to do, but the relationships I've been able to make with people. And sometimes it's not even people you work with, but like I randomly met a girl who's now a good friend and she's a jag and we hang out all the time. And, you know, like just these like little connections you make with people are amazing. It's people you would never meet on the outside necessarily necessarily or right. even think you had anything in common with and then you realize just these people become your family and it's fantastic and I wouldn't give that up for the world. I love it. You say that that's not a popular answer, but that is <laughs> the answer for the military because yes, operations are cool. Yes, being a uniform wearing member of the military is cool. And, you know, we actually make a pretty good living absolutely, as officers, right? And all those things are great and wonderful, traveling the world and all that. But it really comes down to it. We stay because of the people. Oh, yeah. If it weren't for the people that we get to spend our time with, it's not worth it. Yep. I totally agree. Yep. Well, awesome. I think that is a fantastic place to leave it. But I have two more questions for you. Okay. So the first one here is if somebody wants to pick your brain on becoming an Air Force nurse, they're interested in the different specialties, maybe they want to be a pediatric nurse practitioner, maybe they want to be a flight nurse or something like that. If they have questions for you, what is the best way for them to get in touch with you? My email address would be the best way. Personal email is a little better. My Gmail would be perfect. And okay. I am definitely happy to try to help anyone. I will definitely say, just like any other military process, everything is so unique to the time and situation. Things have changed dramatically since I came in. So definitely, if you're interested, contact your nearest medical recruiter. And those are different than like a normal recruiter. It has to be a medical recruiter. Okay. Contact them as soon as you can. Start reaching out. Get that early contact. But I'm more than happy to help her answer any questions. Great. So we will link your email here in the show notes, members of the audience, they can go there to get in touch with you. Great. All right, Megan, last question for you. What does it mean to be an officer? Oh, it's a huge responsibility. At a moment's notice, you could be responsible for making life changing decisions for a patient for a unit in scary combat settings for like an entire fob. But it's an amazing responsibility too. you have an opportunity to change life all around you and really make an impact on people's lives. Absolutely. I love it. Captain Megan Thien, thank you so much for taking the time to share your story with us. This arc of adventure across <laughs> multiple services, multiple countries, multiple career fields. It's been so fun to listen to, to get more information about the nursing corps in general, about the flight nurse career field more specifically. Really enjoyed it. It's been fantastic listening to all of this from you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, Reed, you've heard it now. She went from being in the Army to being a pediatric nurse practitioner, being the only one who was selected from all of the applicants to join the Air Force, to now being a flight nurse. I mean, like you said in the opening, she always has something going on. What were some of your thoughts? 
the first one that I thought of is what am I doing to improve myself right now? Yeah. As she describes, you know, her journey, high school into the army and her reasons for doing that. And then, you know, how she was studying and going to school and taking classes, you know, because she wanted this other goal of being a nurse practitioner. Colin, she got a pig and a microscope delivered to Iraq so she could take <laughs> classes. Are you kidding me? In the middle of a combat deployment as a medic. Yeah. Like what? So what am I doing? What am I doing to improve <laughs> myself right now? Because clearly this is my competition in every good way, right? Yeah. These are the kinds of people we get to be associated with, Colin, and it's amazing. But the question I kept asking myself is what am I doing right now? To improve myself. And so I want to ask that question to our audience too. Wherever you are, whatever your station is, whether you think you've arrived or not, what are you doing right now to improve yourself? Yeah, because if you're not improving yourself, what are you doing? You're stagnating. Yeah. You're not adding to yourself in your ability to contribute to the Air Force mission and the people around you. Yeah. And what this looks like for everybody is going to be very different. Sure. Right. I'm not saying you need to be studying for your third PhD while you, you know, write UN draft resolutions or anything. <laughs> but at the same time, maybe what that means is you need to take a knee for yourself and your family. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what you're doing to improve yourself. Right. So I also don't want us to walk around being all judgy. Oh, well, I'm doing 27 additional duties and my primary mission. I just want us each to ask that question of ourselves. And that's why I phrased it that way. Yeah. I want you to be honest with yourself. What are you doing right now to improve yourself? Yeah. And are you doing it or are you letting it be done to you? Yeah. That was another thing. I know you wanted to bring that up. Absolutely. Are you active or a passive participant in your own development? And the argument should be that 100% you need to be active in that, even if just as you said, Reed, that is to take a knee and step back a little bit. Did you make that choice or did somebody make that choice for you because you were burning the candle at both ends going 200 miles an hour? And finally, somebody said, whoa, you need to take a step back. Yeah. And that's a life skill, Colin. That's not just, you know, your career as an officer. That's a life skill. Does life happen to you? Or do you live life deliberately the way you want? Yeah. And that was the thing that I took away from that. I was just inspired by Captain Theme's tenacity, by her just grit, like just wants to get this done. Mm -hmm. And I think that leads us into the next point that you wanted to talk about is this is how you get it. If you want to be part of what this is, look at her example because that's how it gets done. Yeah, absolutely. She made her career happen. She is making it happen. She didn't just sit back and let the Army or then the Air Force, or let's take a pause there, the boards to get into the Air Force tell her exactly what is going to happen. I mean, she got rejected twice before she finally got picked up to be a nurse in the Air Force. She went after this opportunity to become a flight nurse. She made these things happen for her because she was continually improving herself, taking classes, studying the things that she needed to know, networking with other people, gathering information so that she could make more informed decisions with what to do with her time and her career to make these things happen. If you want to know how to get from A to B, this is how you do it. Yes, totally agree. We've brought it up in multiple episodes, right? Especially when we talk about how to get into OTS. You have to go out and get it. This is what that looks like in all of the good ways. And, you know, I said it already, but these are the people we get to be around, Colin. And it's what makes being an airman awesome. It really, really does. Yeah, absolutely. So grateful for the example that she's sharing with me, with you, with the rest of the audience on what is possible if you will have a little bit of grit, a little bit of determination, and also the willingness to connect with other people in order to make those things happen. Because these things didn't happen completely on her own. She talked about in the interview that this came through networking through getting knowledge of what's possible in the nursing corps, within the Air Force, getting mentorship. I mean, she talked about talking to her chief nurse about this opportunity and was highly encouraged to go and do it. 
Yeah, absolutely. How she went out and got that mentorship to help her get where she wanted to go. And that kind of leads me to something else, Colin, we wanted to address. She mentioned how she was very instrumental during her COT training in helping others get through that experience. Yeah. Because she had previous experience in the Army and she understood a little bit more about the game. She even talked about how at MEPS, there was someone who was applying to be in a similar career field and some tech sergeant was kind of sharp with this person and they're like, I don't know if I can do this. And she was able to help them guide through that experience because it leads us to an important thing that Colin, you and I kind of just know is truth, but can be a pretty stark experience for people if they're not aware. Yeah. Is the mind game that is not only Air Force training, but the Air Force to a large degree. Why don't we talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So she brought this up in the interview specific to the Air Force training context, specifically commissioned officer training, which is how things were organized at the time. It's now total force officer training. Just real quick, Reed, explain what's the difference between the two. So it used to be caught or commissioned officer training was only, as she described, everyone who already had a commission, the medical, legal, and chaplain professionals, they would all go through this different training. It was much shorter. Everyone's wearing rank. And it was basically, this is how you wear your uniform. This is how you spell Air Force. Thank you very much, ma'am, sir. Go do your job. Yeah. And it was found wanting. And so the medical side of things, the Surgeon General of the Air Force asked for a better, more broad experience with that initial training. And so they've combined them all together. Some will leave after five weeks, but that's a legal thing that they're trying to work through. But bottom line, all officers going through OTS go through essentially the same training program right now. Yeah. And that's so that they all have a similar experience with Air Force training. And that kind of, again, gets back into what we were describing here of this mind game that is played in the Air Force training context, Yeah, which we've talked about in the deep dive to OTS. We've talked about in the Academy episodes. Air Force ROTC, there's always this moment, and it's usually toward the beginning, but it it can dry out over the course of the training where the switch flips and all of a sudden you are no longer in the civilian environment, but you are now in the military training environment where you are going to hear raised voices, you're going to fall in line, you're going to march around, and most importantly, you are going to be task saturated. Yes. You are going to be given way more things to do than you can humanly do. And that is by design. Let's talk about why. Why do we do that in the Air Force training environment, Reed? There's a couple of reasons that I really key in on. And before anyone thinks that this is unique to the Air Force, it's not. These concepts are really key. The first one is to teach you to rely on others Mm -hmm. because you cannot do this on your own. Nothing you will ever do in the United States military is going to be by yourself. You are going to be part of an incredibly talented, skilled, but also very vast team to accomplish your missions. And in order for you, who has largely relied on yourself to get where you are in life, you need to learn how to rely on a team, how to build those connections quickly, how to communicate with others very quickly and clearly. And so if you have more than you can do on your own, you might just have to ask somebody for some help. Yeah. Oh my gosh. (gasps) Gasp, right? (laughs) I've mentioned this before. I had a student, very, very experienced student, very smart, very sharp, break down in my queue one day and just said, I thought officers were just better because this person couldn't do everything I was asking of them. I'm like, yes, we've arrived. We've made it to the moment where you now see that I need you to rely on other people. They started delegating, they started communicating, they started problem solving, and they're like, oh, this is it. Yes, so that's one, that's a really big one that I like to bring up. Yeah, and putting this into our three C's model, that connection piece, obviously being described there, you have to rely on other people, but I wanna take it one step further that competence is as a result of connection. Yes. Not in every circumstance. I mean, you as the individual bring a lot to the table yourselves, but being able to rely on others is a competence. That is a competency that you must have to be effective as an Air Force officer, whether that's in the training environment, 
preparing to become an officer or even through other trainings that we do, daily training or large scale exercises or anything like that, that remains true or just in the daily operations actually carrying out the mission. Connecting with other people is a competency that will help you to be effective in this game of the Air Force. Yes, absolutely. And I don't know, Colin, it's something about, you know, learning different leadership techniques as part of, you know, our initial training. What better way to exercise them than with people that are different than you? Yeah. I don't know. It's almost like we did it on purpose. <laughs> Sorry. And that's the point here, Reed, yeah, is that I know. it is on purpose. The whole thing is on purpose. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And we gripe all the time about the inefficiencies of how the Air Force is organized. And to an extent, yeah, a lot of those should be ameliorated, should be changed through policy, through budgets, through manpower and all that sort of thing. But a lot of this game has to remain in place so that we can get the result that we're looking for, which is officers and airmen, you know, enlisted airmen too, who are not only competent, but can rely on each other. Yes. Something else, Colin, with this task saturation, we want to see how you react. We want to see you prioritize. We want to see you act on priorities. Mm -hmm. And should the moment arise, we want to teach you how your priorities should be organized. I'd have students, you know, spending way too much time on something happening in three weeks from now and not enough time on the thing I just told you about 45 seconds ago. Yeah. You know, like that was a learning tool as well. So there is also a competence aspect, not just their competence in their ability to be able to connect, which you, I think, did a good job describing, but also you're just your straight up competence. Can yeah. you manage a lot of things? Because combat is not the right time for you to figure out how to prioritize and how to do what has to get done right now. Not just combat, but when you have that airman who needs leadership right now, that's not the time to figure it out either. Agreed. Colin, that brings up another thing. It makes me remember when I was transitioning from Air Force training environment to the real Air Force. This is something that Lieutenant Colonel King, in our episode about the 65 Foxtrot or finance episode, he mentioned how that transition was hard. And we didn't talk about it then, but it just reminded me, you know, as we talked about with Captain Theme and her you know, telling others about that this is a little bit a game, you know, the Air Force training environment. I've reflected back on my own experience transitioning from being a cadet to being an officer. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. I remember talking to my sponsor on the phone. So I was moving from training in Alabama to Central Florida to Patrick Air Force Base. Now, Garrison Patrick or something. Yeah, something like that. It's Space Force stuff. So I don't know what's going on with that. When you're at OTS, the first words out of your mouth are sir or ma'am, unless you're saying yes, sir, or no, sir. Like, that's it. So lots of sirs going on. And I was a good cadet, and so I was very good at maintaining that standard. And during our phone conversation, my sponsor said, if you call me sir one more time, I'm hanging up <laughs> and I'm not talking to you. And he was serious. I just got that really big pregnant pause on the phone. And I said, okay, <laughs> <laughs> because it was hard. And, you know, when I went back as an instructor, it was something we talked a lot about. We got a lot of feedback, especially from our prior enlisted students, that this is not what the Air Force is like. And the non-priors are not getting really well prepared for day-to-day -day life as a lieutenant. And it was really hard. And we talked a lot about how to make that transition better. We did some things during grad week to try and dismantle the facade that is, you know, not only you as an instructor, Colin, we've talked about how you have to basically put on a character, yep. you know, to be an effective instructor. And that's deliberate and it's good. I'm not saying that that's wrong, but I'd be interested in your thoughts on that transition. Maybe OTS was uniquely challenging because it's so concentrated and such a heightened training experience for a short period of time versus ROTC and USAFA, which are more of a slow burn. I don't know. I'd just be interested in that transition. No, I had a similar experience, even though I went through ROTC. When I arrived at my first duty station, when I went to Andrews, nobody told me what to expect. 
So I wore my blues. I was as sharp as I could get. I expected that I was going to be squaring my corners, marching into the commander's office to report in, say, sir, Lieutenant Slade is present for duty or I don't know, something along those lines and was completely disarmed when he called me by my first name. Hey, Colin, come on in. And I'm like, what? Sorry, (laughs) because I was so there. I I just. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. And so then that colored my whole first reporting experience showing up at the base because, like, you're saying nobody prepared me for that. Yeah, your orders say you will report. Yeah. Words have meaning. And when I saw at OTS, you will report, I went to the page in the Otsman that described exactly what reporting looks like. I looked at my (laughs) reporting statement, right? I mean, that's because that's how you're successful in training. And that's on purpose. Yeah. That's on purpose. And... We did some things to try and change that gap. I would hold, at least I tried to, a, okay, let's be real lesson (laughs) with my students. Yeah. And I would really rely on the prior enlisted. And that's one thing I loved. And I've said this before. I loved that my prior enlisted students were able to help bring some of that reality to the training environment. But yeah, we'd have a, okay, this is what it's really going to be like. Yeah, we tried to do some of that. It was just a hard transition. And I thought she captured some of that well with her ideas of the mind game of training. Yeah. But the thing that we need to be clear about here is that the mind game of Air Force training ends when you get into the active duty or the reserve Air Force, but the game still continues. It's just different. Yes. Right? You are still going to be task saturated. You are still going to find that you have to rely on others and you can't do everything yourself. That all still remains. It's just the context is different. Yeah. Right? Agreed. And there's all sorts of silly things that you're going to end up having to do. Yeah. You know, the queep (laughs) is real. It's stuff that you're going to have to deal with. And the skills that you gain in training are there to help you navigate that successfully. So too long, didn't read. There's a method to the madness. Accept the training for what it is and see the so what and you'll be more successful, both in training and later. Yeah. And thank you to Megan for setting the example of how to be successful through all of it, right? To play the game and to play it well, to have that vision of what's possible and be looking ahead to the next thing. Yes, be present here in the moment, be effective in the things that you're doing currently or in preparation to do things for the Air Force, but always preparing yourself to take advantage of the next opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, Megan, for demonstrating how to do that for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. That leads me to something I wanted to address. Colin, talk about that next opportunity. She saw and heard of an experience that was attracted to her, and that was to be on an aircraft, to be a flight nurse. We've already talked about how she went and got some mentorship, you know, to answer that question, you know, if she really wanted to do it. But what I wanted to point out was the sparkle. We got to see it because I watched the Zoom recording, right? So I could see her eyes light up as she started talking about aircraft and air power and flying and missions and ops and flight suits and the whole thing. And that is so real. But you could also hear it in her voice. Yeah. She just became alive. And why is that? Because it's the family business. It's what we do. And I want everybody to think about where they are relative to that mission of flying The farther away from that you are and the more disconnected you and your airmen feel from that mission, the more important it is for you to find a way to connect to that mission, whether that's calling up somebody that you met who knows somebody who's at the flying squadron so that you can do like an exchange where for one afternoon you're going to bring over your five highest performing airmen and you're just going to walk through the hangar. Just watch the effect that has on your airmen. They will light up. They will remember it for years to come and their performance will improve. Their ability to accomplish their mission goes up and you got to connect. For me, that looked like, hey, we're going to go in a van to the end of the runway where the B1s are taking off at full afterburner, all four engines, 70 feet or whatever of flames shooting out the back. That's what that looked like for me. And yeah, I still remember that. The whole van was shaking. It was amazing. You know, so that is what you could do. And that's our job as a leader. 
I, I really feel strongly about that. You've got to connect your people because for some, this is literally what they do every day. They get on aircraft, they go do cool things. Yeah. For others, it's something that they see sometimes occasionally. I'm at an installation right now that doesn't have aircraft. It's an army base. Lame. <laughs> and I went TDY and I saw aircraft and it's like, oh, look at those big, beautiful gray aircraft, you know, just flying around. Yeah. But they're still off in the distance. I cannot wait. I cannot wait to be outside on a flight line without my cover on, walking with security forces so they don't arrest me to go see an airplane again. Like, that's going to be really great. Yeah. And we got to do that. We got to do that, Colin. We got to connect people to our mission. Yeah, absolutely. On the flip side, Reed, we need to connect the flyers, those who are doing the mission, with all of those other people who make the mission possible. Yeah, totally agree. That it can't just be one directional, everybody focused on just the flying mission, which, yes, that is ultimately what we're all here for. But if the flyers, the air crew don't have a context with the airman who is processing their paperwork or those who are getting them parts to fix the aircraft or acquisitions process of how that engine on the back of the B-1 gets made or repaired or something like that, then we're not connecting all of the dots. We're not completing the circle that is how Air Force operations take place. Yeah, totally agree. And another story with that, because it reflects that exact same idea. When I was in Hawaii, we had a really good leader who was able to connect us with a flying unit on the island. It was a Navy element who flew a reconnaissance platform. And I was in the business of tasking reconnaissance platforms. That was my job. Yeah. So we worked out an exchange where the, we brought in their entire organization and showed them, this is how we task you. This is how we tell you where you are going to fly and why. And they're like, oh, so you're not all just a bunch of idiots who just try to ruin our lives and pick the worst flights. You actually have <laughs> like a deliberate process. Oh, you're actually smart people. And it made things infinitely better. And I got to go sub hunting off the coast of Hawaii in an anti-submarine reconnaissance aircraft, right? I mean, for them, they're just doing their job. Same for me. I was just doing my job. But on both sides, things got better. And so I'm really glad you brought that up, Colin. We also have to connect those who are doing the sexy, the cool with the things that they were reliant on to do their mission. And I think both parties will benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Again, this goes back to our three C's model. There has to be a connection. There has to be competence. And having the character in place where those conversations are possible, that there's that common framework, that instant ability to trust each other is how these things happen. Yeah, totally agree. Colin, at the top of this episode, I mentioned I had some humble pie to eat. Oh, that's right. Yeah, learned some stuff. We've given a number of episodes about what an officer should be. And part of that, you know, we didn't like the idea of certain career fields only being officers. You know, that was something I stood on my soapbox and I shouted at the sky and, you know, I said, this is how it shall be. I got that one wrong especially in this one. And this was the first argument that I had heard that that was very clear about why a nurse needs to be an officer. She said that she gives legal and lawful orders to the air crew who are flying the airplanes, you know, in order for her patients to get the best transportation possible so that they can live. Mm -hmm. She needs to be an officer to do that. She gives legal and lawful orders to her patients thou shalt take this medicine twice daily or whatever it is, right? Yeah, right. That's a legal standing order. And she needs to be an officer to do that. And why is that, Reed? What is it about being an officer? What is it about the commission that enables that? Why couldn't it be an enlisted airman who has that military context, right? They've been through the training, even the mind game of Air Force training that we've talked about. Why couldn't it be them? As opposed to, and we'll agree that it couldn't be a civilian, right? Yeah, it's the authority. It's the authority that comes from the commission, from the commander in chief, through the constitution. That's the authority. You can have the position, you could have the knowledge all day, but I don't want to take my medication because I don't like the way it makes me feel. And then I am not healing it the way I'm supposed to be. And therefore, I am not available to the government. I have disobeyed an order. 
And unless there's authority there, then the whole system breaks down. Yeah. We've talked about good order and discipline. We've talked about why we have to have officers. And, you know, I got this one wrong. I got this one wrong. And I really am grateful that she was able to teach me. And that gets back to so many things we've talked about. What am I doing to improve myself? Well, I'm learning that I was wrong. Yeah. And that I need to broaden my scope and connect with more people so that I can understand what's going on out there. Yeah, I got this one wrong, so I'll own that. And thank you, Reed, for being vulnerable and being willing to accept that. I, too, feel like there's much more to this discussion than just the black and white. There should or there should not be officers who are nurses or doctors or dentists or whatever. I think that this is something that we could continue to have a conversation about, like what does right look like for the nursing corps, for the medical corps, for the Air Force as a whole? Where is the right place to have officers and that authority of the commission versus not? But I appreciate, just as you are saying, the cogent argument that Megan brought in support of having her career field being officers and having the authority of the commission there. Yeah. You know, something else she talked about is the decision making, the life and death decision making. I don't think that's exclusive to the commission, but I did think that she made some interesting points about there has to be someone in the room to make the decision, and that needs to come with some authority. And anyway, really good discussion. I agree. There's more to be had there. But so, yeah, to all of those who I may have wronged with my, you know, <laughs> minimizing of your role, I got it wrong. I got it wrong in this one. And Definitely makes me think about how much there is to know out there. That's for sure. Yeah. And Reed, that is why we are doing this. That is. Yep. So that you and I can learn these things. And we hope that the audience is learning these things as well. That maybe there is someone out there who, when we have presented our ideas, were nodding vigorously up and down. Absolutely. They agree that the medical and the nursing corps should be contracted out to the civilian population or be made and listed, but maybe they too now are willing to own our mistake and see that there are other possible ways of going about this that are going to be even better for our Air Force. Yeah. You know, full circle, right? What are you doing today to improve yourself? That's what I was doing as I was getting schooled by Megan. Super glad she was able to join us. Really enjoyed her energy and excitement and enthusiasm. Made me want to get out and touch some aircraft again. But anything else before we wrap up this week, Colin? I just hope that our audience will share it because that's what we're doing here is trying to put this information out there. I know I say this every single time. If you got anything out of this episode, please share it with your network, help others get a better understanding of this clearly lesser known part of what officers do for the Air Force. So thank you, Megan. Thank you for taking the time to share your knowledge with us and make us all a little bit smarter. Yep. Appreciate it very much. Totally agree. Reach out to us if you have any questions. We'd love to hear from you. That will conclude this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.